Greetings. This is going to be part eight of the Fire of the Lord series. Turn your Bibles to Isaiah chapter nine. This is a continuation of the last study where we just finished Isaiah chapter eight. All right, uh, get your King James Bibles. Isaiah chapter nine. This is Chaplain Bob. Verse 1. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. Now, for those of you that don't know it, Zebulun and Naphtali were two of the tribes, two of the twelve tribes of Israel. And afterward he did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. And that word nations is the same word that they also translate sometimes as Gentiles. Verse 2. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Didn't Jesus say that in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Oh yeah, eternal life. And they were in the shadow of death. Now, what happens when you take light and light up an entire area? Well, there's no more shadows. It's only when you have a single point of light and something blocking the light that you actually have a shadow, right? So if you have light that shine and illuminates an entire area, there are no shadows. And what is darkness? Darkness is the absence of light. And if Jesus is the light, well then, Satan is the darkness, right? Verse 3. Thou hast multiplied the nation. He's talking about Israel here. He's, he took Israel and he multiplied them. He increased them in number. Thou hast multiplied the nation and not, not increased the joy. Now, in some of the modern Bible versions, it says, Thou hast multiplied the nation and increased the joy. Increasing the joy and not increasing the joy does not mean the same thing. So, obviously, one of the Bible versions is wrong. And it's the modern ones, but hey, what can I tell you? That's why you have to use the King James. The King James, when you use the King James, the themes are woven into the Bible. One theme leads to another. And when you use the modern versions, it destroys that. The continuity is destroyed. And... That's how I know. Thou hast multiplied the nation and not increased the joy. Why? Because they forsook the Lord. They joy before thee according to the joy of harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. Like a bunch of robbers that just finished robbing a bunch of people. They're all happy because they get to divide what they robbed. Verse 4, for thou hast broken, for thou, who's thou? God. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. Now, what is a yoke? Y-O-K-E. Well, it's like a collar. You would take uh, two oxens, 
you would put this yoke around their neck and then you would use that to connect a plow to it and you would take the two oxen and you would plow the land and that's why it was kind of uh, it was con it was a burden you would take an animal and put this burden on them sort of like when you put uh, a bridle on a horse you know you could use horses to plow too but oxen were perfect because they would they wouldn't travel very fast and you could control the direction so that you plow in straight lines if that's what you wanted but it was a collar that you would put around their neck and their shoulders to be able to uh, pull a burden or uh, a cart or something of that nature okay but what does it say in 2 Corinthians 6 14 Paul writes be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers so you know you don't want to uh, it's likened a husband and a wife it's like you know two oxen two oxes that are have this yoke with them you don't want one pulling one way and the other pulling the other way it doesn't work right so be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship hath unrighteousness with have I'm sorry for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion hath light with darkness huh in Matthew 11 and 29 and 30 Jesus said take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart and ye shall find rest unto your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light as in doesn't weigh much now what did Jesus say he gave us the two commandments love the Lord love thy neighbor and he also said forgiveness you know learn to forgive others so that we would be forgiven I mean the two commandments and forgiveness I mean you know that's basically that is Christ's yoke I mean you know love the Lord and love thy neighbor as thyself and have a forgiving spirit now that's a pretty easy yoke and a light very light burden if you ask me all right back to Isaiah 9 verse 4 for thou hast broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder for the rod of his oppressor is I'm sorry as in the day of Midian for every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood but this shall be with burning and fuel of fire oh there's that fire again for unto us now what do you think they're talking about here for unto us a child is born unto us a son is given not a daughter and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called wonderful counselor the mighty God the everlasting father the Prince of Peace Huh. Let's break this down. Unto us a child is born. 
All right, what about this rod of iron? Let's go to Revelation chapter 2, verse 26. Jesus speaking, And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shiver, shivers, even as I have received of my Father. Let's see. Revelation chapter 12. Now let's take a look at what that has to say. Boy, I've covered this a lot. Verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with chi uh, child, cried, travailing a birth, and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Obviously, this is talking about Christ. All right, so let's take a look at Revelation 19. And let's see. Let's start in verse 11. Revelation 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, righteousness, he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Oh, yeah. So, let's see. So, who is this? Uh, he's called the mighty God and the Father, right, in Isaiah 9. Well, in John chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus said, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Now, why is... Uh, so he's, his name shall be called, in Isaiah 9, 6, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. 
Well, after he sets up his kingdom, uh, there'll be peace on earth, right? But why counselor? Well, a counselor, the modern usage in America today, a counselor is like somebody when you're in high school that talks to you about, you know, things. But in England, a counselor was considered like an attorney, a lawyer. Like when you were charged with a crime, you would hire a counselor to speak for you before the judge. Now, in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5, we read, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Now, a mediator, you know, you get a, two people that are um, fighting over something in a legal battle. Well, you, sometimes they hire a mediator, somebody that's a disinterested party, to try to have the two parties come to an agreement. And a mediator and a counselor have some similarities. But when you go before God the Father as your judge, wouldn't you want to have as a counselor, a mediator, your attorney, the judge's son, Christ? Uh, yeah, I think I would. Yeah, I, I think I would want the, the judge's son as my attorney. But Hey, what can I tell you? That's just me. All right, let's go. Verse 7, Isaiah 9, 7. So he's called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So, there will be a time when the King of Kings and Lord of Lords will have a government on this earth. All right, let's take a look at Luke chapter 1 and verse 31. Uh, the angel speaking to Mary. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Yeshua HaMashiach. No, no, no. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign, not, not water falling from the sky, but ruling and reigning, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. All right, let's zip on over to Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded. This is the seventh trump. And the seventh angel sounded. And there were... And there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So that's the name of that tune. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 14, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, 
and may enter in through the gates into the city. What city? New Jerusalem. For without, in other words, the outside, outside for without are dogs and saucers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. Now, how can Jesus be the root and the offspring of David? Well, real simple. He created all things, including Adam and the earth. And, yeah, I mean, if he created Adam from the dust of the earth, and Adam eventually begat King David, and then if Christ came from that line, you know, then in, as in the flesh, he's the offspring of David. But in the spirit, he was the root. So he's the, I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And uh, if you look in the NIV Bible, the original 84 version, uh, guess who the morning star is? The guy in Isaiah 14 that fell from heaven. Yeah, in the King James, they call him Lucifer. So they take the morning star and insert morning star in place of Lucifer. So guess what? Jesus becomes the morning star that fell from heaven in Isaiah 14. Did Jesus fall from heaven in Isaiah 14? Uh, I don't think so. And then idiots will argue and say, well, you know, Lucifer is a Latin word. It doesn't belong in the Bible. Well, guess what? About at least 20% of the English language is derived from Latin. I mean, going by that argument, uh, don't use the word taco. It's Spanish. Uh, you know, horrible. You know, don't say taco. Say uh, corn, a corn thingy with, uh, with sauce on it. And don't say salsa either. That's Spanish too. I mean, you know, that's their arguments. And I'm sorry, but Luciferians know who Lucifer is. But people that argue that the NIV is a good translation, uh, they don't know who Lucifer is? Really? Luciferians know who Lucifer is. They know he's Satan and the devil. So, really, you're you're gonna these these people in the NIV deleted Lucifer and inserted the Morning Star, and they want you to believe that Jesus, the Morning Star, fell from heaven. Now you know why I love the King James. Well, I'll tell you what: the people that did this in the NIV, they they're gonna have to uh, explain this one day probably at the white throne judgment. So, And oh, by the way, the uh, complete Jewish Bible by uh, uh, a so-called Messianic Jew named Stern, he does the same thing. He does the exact same thing that the NIV did. And people wonder why I don't trust them. Uh, yeah. But they don't say Jesus. They say Yeshua. Yeah, Yeshua is the morning star, and then the morning star fell from heaven. Oh, yeah. So, back to Isaiah 9. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and establish it with justice and uh, with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The Lord sent a word unto Jacob, and it hath lighted upon Israel. And all the people that shall know that Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, that say in the pride and stoutness of heart, now Ephraim was the main tribe of Israel in the north, in the divided kingdom of Israel and Judah, and Samaria was their capital. So, 
That's what, you know, even Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria that say in the pride and stoutness of heart, the bricks are fallen down, but we will build them with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will change them into cedars. Therefore the Lord shall set up the adversaries of reason against them and join his enemies together, the Syrians before and the Philistines behind. And they shall devour Israel with open mouth. For all this his anger is not turned away. For all this his anger is not turned away. He's mad, people. But his hand is stretched out still. People, let me tell you something. God's anger is not going to be turned away except by his son, Jesus Christ. But it says his hand is stretched out still. If you were drowning in the sea and somebody came up with a boat and put out their hand to pull you out of the water, that's what your hand is stretched out still. Your hand is stretched out. All you have to do is take hold of the hand and pull. Accept deliverance. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. You know, there's a time, people, when the Lord's... It, when he, that's it. I mean, there, there comes a time when his hand... He take when he when his hand is stretched out, and they don't want that. Eventually, the Lord gives up. In Proverbs chapter one and verse twenty-four, it says, "Because I have called." The Lord called, because I have called, and ye refused. I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But ye have said it not, all my counsel. Not means nothing. The Lord's counsel, his words, meant nothing. But ye have said it not, all my counsel and would none of my reproof. When God punished them for their evil, they didn't consider it. Verse 26, I also will laugh, laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, Think about hurricanes and tornadoes. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction, your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me early, but they, will not, they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge, they hated godly knowledge, people. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all, of my, uh, all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from the uh, fear of evil. Let's go back to verse 12. Isaiah 9. The Syrians before and the Philistines behind, they shall and they shall devour Israel with open mouth. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Well, there comes a time when the Lord's hand is no longer out. The offer of salvation is closed. There comes that time, but this is not, right now is not it. 
Verse 13. For the people turneth not unto him that smiteth them, neither do they seek the Lord of hosts. Therefore the Lord will cut off from Israel head and tail, branch and rush in one day. The ancient and honorable, he is the head. And the prophet that teacheth lies, he is the tail. And tell you what, people, you take an animal's tail and lift it up, what do you see? The prophet that teacheth lies. He is the tail. You know, that's why teaching, teaching the Bible, it's scary. Because you're going to have to give an account for everything that you teach. What's going to happen to all these people that taught lies to the sheep? What's going to happen to them? I mean, you live a wicked life. Yeah, you're going to be held responsible. But what about him that teaches lies? Ooh. And the prophet that teaches lies, he is the tale. For the leaders of this people cause them to err. That's a root word for error. For the leaders of this people cause them to err, and they that are led of them are destroyed. Therefore the Lord shall have no joy in their young men, neither shall have mercy on their fatherless and widows, for every one is an hypocrite. Yeah, me too. For every one is an hypocrite and an evildoer, and every mouth speaketh folly. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. For wickedness burneth as the fire. There's that fire again. For wickedness burneth as the fire. It shall devour the briars and thorns and shall kindle in the thickets of the forest. And they shall mount up like the lifting of, up of smoke. Though the wrath, the wrath of the Lord of hosts is the land darkened. And the people shall be as the fuel of the fire. No man shall spare his brother. And he shall snatch on the right hand and be hungry. And he shall eat on the left hand. And they shall not be satisfied. They shall eat every man the flesh of his own arm. Manasseh, Ephraim, and Ephraim, Manasseh. And they together shall be against Judah. Ephraim and Manasseh were uh, two tribes of, Israel, of northern Israel. And they together shall be against Judah. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. All right, you want to see a hand, uh, where the Lord stretches out his hand? Turn to Matthew chapter 14. We're going to start in verse 22. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. So evidently Jesus had been teaching the multitudes, tells his people, hey, get into the ship, go to the other side, and he sent the multitudes away. Verse 23. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. Oh yeah, if you're out in the middle of the ocean, you see some uh, uh, figure of a man walking on the sea. Yeah, you're going to think, oh boy, look, it's a, uh, a spirit. You're hoping it's a good one, but it could be a bad one, right? Like a ghost. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, 
Bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, oh yeah, he saw how the wind howling and the waves crashing. It says, But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me! And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand, Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? You see, when we're in the storms of life and we take our eyes off Jesus and we start looking at the waves and the wind, you'll sink. And that's what Peter did. He took his eyes off Christ and he looked at the storm and he had he he doubted and that's what happens to us people and that's what happens Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and saved him from the storm and said unto him O thou of little faith wherefore didst thou doubt and that people, God stretches forth his hand. And if you don't believe Jesus is God come in the flesh, may I suggest you read 1 Timothy 3, 16. That's all I can say. All right, well, this is Chaplain Bob, Light of the World Ministries. All blessing, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. This is part eight of the fire series. And we did Isaiah chapter nine. And uh, boy, this could be a 20 part series by, by the time I get done. But, you know. But if you make it unto the end, it'll be worth it. And I'm not talking about my Bible series. I'm talking about the kingdom of God, of course. So I'm, I'm not that full of pride, new no, 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 no. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed this. And all glory to Jesus. In his precious name, amen.